Hello, so I'm Chris. I'm one of the editors and partners here at Tortoise. Thank you ever so much for coming today. This is the, what feels like 96th of our thinking today, or the second day of our festival. For those of you who have not been to one of these before, uh, they, let me start with a little spiel. The idea of these things, which we call thinkings, is that they're supposed to be a bit like a newspaper leader conference. And what a newspaper leader conference does is it helps journalists work out uh, what the things we agree on are, what the things we disagree on are, and what the things we need to find out more about. And that helps, obviously, with writing comment pieces, but also with sort of setting reporting priorities. What are the things we need to deploy people to actually find out about? And the fundamental problem with leader conferences is they're full of journalists who don't really know a great deal except about page layout. The innovation of the thinking is that we bring in people who do know what they're talking about, we bring in our members, and we bring in external experts. And we're talking today about inequality. We've called it pay and perks, which partly reflect the fact that we're really interested in the, um, the way that people get paid. But actually, this is really a thinking about inequality. And we've got some experts here. We don't actually have some experts. We have among us probably the expert. We have Sir Michael Marmot, who is, if you're interested in inequality, the voice of the burning bush. The, <laughs> there are the, Sir Michael wrote, uh, well, led sort of a sequence of research products that, are, that answer really fundamental questions about the human condition in a way that is incredibly rare. If you, if you have never looked at them, I strongly recommend them, because it's a sort of, they're a testament to the power of social science. We also have Francis Coppola. I'm really sorry I can't, I can't match my description of, of, of the voice of the burning bush. But, but Francis has written a wonderful new book on um, uh, the future of monetary policy and what we need to do uh, to make modern monetary policy work, how we make it work for people in particular. We also have my former colleague, Kamal Ahmed, who is now editorial director of the BBC, formerly the uh, economics and business editor. Um, those are two separate jobs. Um, the sequentially. Sequentially, yeah. <laughs> um, I feel like it's, we've actually got, if we move the slides on, one of the things um, we're going to have to end up talking a lot about today is what we mean when we talk about inequality. And what this exciting graph shows you is, first of all, types of inequality doesn't jump around a lot from year to year. but what kind of inequality you talk about is really important. And you can see uh, the Gini coefficient, which is the thing we're going to talk about a bit in various ways. Variant, when it's high, it means a society is more unequal. When it's low, it means a society is less unequal. What it really shows you is that income inequality, that is to say how different our wages are, are less unequal than how much just stuff we have. If you think about inheritance and, and pensions and categories of assets, the further you get away from just naked wages, the more unequal society gets. I'm going to ask Sir Michael to tell us why all of this stuff matters to begin with. Because actually, if you've not had the joy of reading the Marmot reports, there is something really fundamental that, that the, 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 the strength of the findings is one of the, and is one of the most astonishing things. So with that. Well, uh, so let me start with the end point, as it were. If you go to Harrods, not to go inside to shop, just outside, and if you're on a bicycle... No, no, could you, for people at the back... Stand up, okay. So if you go to Harrods and you get on your bicycle and cycle to uh, off the Harrow Road, the life expectancy gap for men is 18 years. 18 years. If you want to see a gap in life expectancy of 18 years, you can get on a plane and fly to Addis Ababa. That's an 18 year gap between um, England and Wales and, and Ethiopia. But if you worried about your green footprint, just cycle for half an hour in the London borough of Westminster, and you got an 18. When the Grenfell fire happened, I had a look 
at the figures for Kensington and Chelsea. In the area around Grenfell, compared with the southern part of the borough, the life expectancy gap was 14 years. They don't have Grenfell fires in the southern part of the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. They have embassies, the ambassadors <laughs> live there. The inequalities within that borough are the biggest in the UK. A mean income of something like um, 115,000 pounds and a median of 32,000, forgive the statistics, but it means half the incomes were below 32,000, but the average was well over 100,000. There's some very rich people. So that's, as it were, the end point. Why does it matter? Well, because people die at very different rates because of inequalities of social conditions. It's not simply an income issue, as if it were simple, but it's not simply an income issue. And some have posited a simple relation between the magnitude of income inequality and health, and that's a bit weak, that relationship. It's not simply income inequality that matters. It's inequality of social conditions, but that is correlated, of course, with income and wealth. The next thing to say is people really care. The late, great Tony Atkinson, who died two or three years ago, in his last book, in a, maybe it wasn't his last book, it may have been his second last book, but Inequality it was called, and he'd been working on inequality for all his life. His strong recommendation was that our levels of income inequality should go back to where they were in the 1960s. He didn't think everybody should have the same income, uh, but the levels should go back to where it was in the 1960s. And he points out that surveys in the United States and in Europe, that time, about three years ago, when you ask people, what's the biggest problem facing the world? Number one answer was inequality. Number two was climate change. Now, because of the ridiculous state of Britain, now they say Brexit. But I mean, nobody cared that <laughs> least bit about Europe. Nobody, it just wasn't on anybody's agenda. But inequality was on the agenda. And climate change, of course, should be on the agenda. And my view of why inequality, so firstly, wh why is inequality said to be good? Well, you reward effort and you reward merit. And, and in fact, if you survey the general population, they do not think everybody should have the same income. The population is not egalitarian. They don't think everybody should have the same. They think that people with more responsibility should earn more. In fact, they think that people who head up corporations earn about 12 times more than the low paid factory worker. And when you ask, what do you think the ratio should be? They think it should be six. They think it's 12 and they think it should be six. And of course, as you probably know, the ratio is 350. <laughs> <laughs> so people have no idea how big it is. And they think that what they think it is, they think is about double what it should be. <laughs> but it's not 12 times, it's 350 times. Now why is that bad? It's bad because people think it's unfair. They don't think it's right. It threatens social cohesion. Why should some people have everything and we have so little? Second, everybody agrees with equality of opportunity. If you're right wing, left wing, some other wing, everybody thinks equality of opportunity is a good thing. You can't get any politician to stand up and say, I'm in favor of inequality of opportunity. Everybody thinks equality of opportunity. We don't have it. The whole thing about big inequalities is we don't have equality of opportunity. I can show you the figures for early child development, for educational performance, for the likelihood so of Mike, jobs. Should we put the, the slide up that shows that? If you move on one more, Please. because it's me, this is a, a really unglamorous table, but <laughs> the left hand, the right hand column on that, this table, the Gini coefficient is, as we mentioned before, a measure of how unequal a society's income is. And you can see that 
from top to bottom, running from the Netherlands to the US, they get progressively more unequal. The left-hand number, the social immobility thing, is a number that describes how closely linked a person's income is to the education of their parents. So it tells you about in, uh, immobility. So do people whose parents are graduates become, uh, tend to be richer? And you can see, broadly speaking, the more unequal societies are the ones where, um, where there's more immobility. Yeah. So we don't have it, and that, uh, that relates to the first thought that it's unfair, it's not right. Why is it that my kids don't have the same opportunity? And I can tell you now for the US, the likelihood that the next generation have better income than their parents was about 30 years ago, about 80%, and now it's 50-50. Fracturing of the American dream. The American dream is I worked hard in, in a metal bashing factory and I sent my kids to college and I got a cottage by the lake and you know everything got better. It's not true anymore. It's 50-50 that the likelihood that the kids will have better economic prospect than their parents. And the third reason it's bad is the way I started because it brings in its train high crime rates, bad health, unhappiness. It brings a lot of problems in its train. Were I thinking in an American, and then I'll stop, were I thinking in an American perspective, um, Paul Krugman wrote a, a little piece recently, and he talked about why it's bad that the 0.1% at the top have so much. He talks about raw corruption you know, raw corruption, you know, just actual bribery, um, raw corruption, soft corruption. I mean, I don't know what you called it when Halliburton was getting all the contracts for the Iraq war and Dick Cheney had been the head of Halliburton. He was now the vice president. I don't know what you call that, but maybe soft corruption. Um, and then in the US context, <laughs> mm, yeah. Just correct. <laughs> okay. Uh, in the US context, but it's true in Britain too, campaign contributions, you know, the Conservative Party always has a bigger war chest than the Labour Party. Uh, so campaign contributions, but in the US, it, the money plays an enormous role. And then the fourth, which is much more subtle, and Jane Mayer, who writer for The New Yorker, wrote a book called Dark Money about how these ultra-rich libertarians, they actually fund whole universities. They actually change the political agenda. And I think we have changed the political agenda. The, the where, where we are, what's considered reasonable. I mean, the, um, Jeremy Corbyn's uh, 2017 manifesto was considered highly radical. I think when Harold Macmillan was prime minister, it would have been seen as quite decent. You know, why shouldn't? the East Coast mainline being public ownership. I mean, it wasn't all that radical, but, but um, the, the, the ultra-rich control the political agenda. So there are all those reasons to be worried about it as well. But my concern is very simple. I'm a doctor. I get upset when people get sick for no thought, fault of their own. And these big inequalities in social conditions lead to dramatic inequalities in illness, in length of life, and in quality of life. Could you very briefly, just quickly, tell me about the, your civil service study? Yeah. Just because I, okay. It's so, not, this isn't about gigantic inequality, this is about small inequality. So I was, uh, I've been studying British civil servants. Not many people in this room would say they get excited contemplating the British civil service. <laughs> but, for me, the British Civil Service has been very exciting. <laughs> it changed my life. Well, it probably changed all our lives when we just don't know it, but I know it changed my life. So when I came back to Britain from uh, doing a PhD in Berkeley, California, and I started working on this study of British civil servants, and I was interested in social conditions and health, and they said, 
to me, the people who were running it said, well, unfortunately, we've got very little about social conditions. All we have is people's seniority level. You could look at that. I said, well, OK, that gets a handle on inequalities. But you wouldn't imagine studying inequalities in the British Civil Service. Everyone is employed, stable jobs. I wouldn't like to be employed on the salary of a messenger or doorkeeper in London, but it's a stable job and they do. And the, the top salaries, particularly today, look modest. There are no hedge fund managers, no bankers. I mean, well paid, like doctors, um, you know, reasonable. So you would think it's an unpromising population to study inequalities. We don't have the poorest, we don't have the richest, we have no unemployed, no blue collar, it's all white collar, office-based employment. And it was a stepwise gradient. The lower the grade of employment, the higher the mortality. A fourfold difference going from <laughs> the top to the bottom. I said at the time that the end point of Darwinian evolution is a top grade British civil servant. <laughs> <laughs> the perfect biological specimen <laughs> is an administrator in Whitehall. <laughs> so this remarkable social gradient, and that was really curious. Firstly, conventional wisdom was that it was stressful to be at the top, not the bottom. And I always wondered about that. I wondered who put that rumor around <laughs> that it was more stressful to be at the top than the bottom. Uh, the lower you are, in fact, in my subsequent second Whitehall study, we showed that stress at work was much higher as you go down. You have less control over your life. People dump things on you, and it's not so great to be lower in the hierarchy. And that meant the issue wasn't poverty. The issue was inequality not poverty, or relative poverty, because the absolute conditions for people second from the top were quite good. Most of them own their own houses. They have stable jobs. Most went to university. They're not in poverty, but they have worse health than the people above them, and all the way down from top to bottom. And that meant we had to deal with relative inequalities. Amartya Sen, great economist and philosopher, said that relative inequalities with respect to income translate into absolute inequalities with respect to capabilities. In other words, it's not just what you have, but what you can do with what you have. All right, and in the poorest part, that I'll just finish, in the poorest part, <laughs> In the poorest part of US cities, for example, <coughs> there's no public transport. There are terrible schools. It's hard to get access to health care. I mean, you really rely on your own money. In the poorest part of Oslo, there's subsidized public transport. There's reasonable schools. There's um, health care free at the point of use. It, it's not quite so bad to be at the bottom of the income scale. So it's relative, not so much what you have, but what you can do with what you have that's crucial for health and well-being. Uh, yeah. um, something I forgot to say at the beginning is just behind us here. <laughs> the tortoise is making its stately way from left to right of the screen. And when it reaches the end, we will have to stop. But the, that's why it's very important if you have things to say, you have to aggressively get forwards and seize your opportunity on the off chance that someone slightly goes over their allotted time. <laughs> the, um, the, um, Kamal, one of, the th one of the things I find striking about uh, inequality and social mobility, actually, is they're both topics where there is a sort of, there is a consensus. You are actually, even where people think that inequality is a necessary precondition of prosperity, you don't find British, even British right-wingers, saying they're relaxed about inequality. You know, they, they have arguments about levels, but I mean, it, it seems sort of dissociated. It's a theoretical thing. Margaret Thatcher, I think, was the last prime minister to admit 
or to, to admit as a politician that there was some good in inequality, the notion that it created uh, a need to strive to better yourself in some manner. I don't think many politicians would risk saying anything like that now. What was interesting when I was economics editor at the BBC was not so much all the people we met and interviewed and talked about their economic life were interested in inequality. It wasn't a word people used. What they were concerned about was their income. And you quote in, your, um, in the blurb for this session, uh, Peter Mandelson's famous quote, the Labour Party is intensely uh, relaxed about people becoming filthy rich as long as they pay their taxes, something he said uh, before the 1997 um, election. And I think the big change around attitudes to inequality and the notion of anger about inequality came in the uh, following the 2007 and 2008 um, financial crisis, when people suddenly realized these huge numbers on inequality because their incomes suddenly stagnated or actually turned negative. So the notion that if you worked hard and played by the rules, in December, you would earn slightly more than you did in January, suddenly stopped being true. And that is why inequality has become such a central political issue now that it wasn't 12 years ago. Even though the actual numbers on inequality, when you look at households in particular, even when you look at uh, straight income, has not actually changed. Inequality is not changing in substance and hasn't really changed in substance since the 1980s. We're just much crosser about it now. There have only been, there have only been three general elections since the Second World War when people's real incomes were going down. 1945, for good reason, many people would say, given the economics of war. 2010 and 2017. And it shows how unusual this decade has been in terms of our economic place. And I think that is why people now are much more focused on the notion that the market has failed in a grander way than maybe they were between 1992 and the last recession in 2007 and the financial crisis, because they don't feel they're getting a part of any growth in wealth. And although inequality hasn't um, changed, that is, that is the big functional change that has happened. What is interesting that despite inequality not changing um, uh, substantially since the 1980s, uh, the future looks far more risky. And I'm interested in Michael's thoughts on um, how much um, inequality is a failure of economics and how much it is a failure of policy. And if you think about London in the 1990s and 2000s and London schools, some of the worst results and outcomes were in poor boroughs in London in the 1990s were transformed by an intense uh, focus on the schools themselves, on the money they got and the skills of the teaching. And although inequality didn't change in London in the 1990s, the outcomes for young people changed hugely. And um, I'm interested in that as, a, as, a, as an idea about economics and policy, which is failing people um, more aggressively. In the future, and anyone who's read Homodeus um, by Yervil Noah Harari will, will um, get this type of argument, um, digital skills, um, access to artificial intelligence could lead to a new type of inequality that he speaks about, which is not so much income inequality, but access to technological advance inequality where a group of people will just simply be left behind because they will not have the incomes to enable themselves to take advantage of the sort of digital future. So although at the moment you can possibly be quite sanguine on income terms and household terms about inequality in terms of it not growing, and particularly the, in a household sense, because there are now many fewer workless households in the UK than there were, many more women are now working, and actual household inequality and inequality for women has actually slightly decreased. Um, it doesn't mean that inequality is not a problem um, or that the anger is not real and justified, but it just gives us a sense that it may not be the economics that is the problem, but it is the policies we put in place that mean that people get such different outcomes dependent on the wealth of the postcode they come from. Can I, if we move one slide on, on cue, so we've actually, the, we have to sort of remember that, I mean, Kamal raises the point that the, the experience of inequality is also unequal. Yes. 
So the first of all, that's the gender pay gap. So that's the sort of raw, it's, a contest, it's not a contested figure, it's a figure that can be calculated in a series of different ways which give you slightly different numbers. But broadly speaking, hour for hour, pound for, well, not pound for pound, hour for hour, women will be paid about 9% less per hour um, than the men. That's a figure that's much smaller for younger women and as motherhood uh, comes through, it widens and widens and widens. And if we go on to one more slide, there is a separate issue as well around the fact that these numbers multiply up if you have other forms of, of, of um, uh, source of potential disadvantage. So white women graduates are seven, like, earn 7% 7 uh, less money per hour than white male graduates, and black men earn 17% less than similarly qualified graduate men. If you're a black woman, you basically have to multiply, you get both of the disadvantages, right? So the, the, these experiences of inequality are, are buried. And actually some of them, they, as Kamal said, some of these are things that actually where we've probably got better within the overall frame. Even if you're a white man, it doesn't, doesn't feel like that, um, which you know, is part of the condition of our modern politics, right? Um, Francis. So your book and your writing more broadly, you're sort of, you've been you're a, you're someone who's thought a lot about how we what's wrong with our economy and how we these are sort of issues that that you framed. Where do you think we should go? Should we start we should start talking positively about um, potential solutions? Well, my book was fairly firmly rooted in the financial crisis, as you know. Um, the response to the financial crisis essentially was to try and prop up asset prices to stop them falling. And that's because, as we saw in the 1930s, when asset prices go into free fall, actually everybody suffers. Um, economies can become very damaged very quickly. And I concluded in the book that it was actually a reasonable response. Where I think we went wrong was after that, when we decided that what we needed to do in order to fix our economies was carrying on Pouring money into assets, into asset prices, as we had been in the immediate aftermath of the crisis, but we carried on doing that for a very long time, while simultaneously withdrawing money from the economy, and in particular, from the poorest parts of society, which economically didn't make a great deal of sense, because actually the people with the least money are the most likely to spend it if you give it to them. So if you actually want to raise aggregate demand, giving, people, giving poorer people money makes a fair degree of sense. And that's essentially the argument for my book, was that we didn't quite get this right. Um, and this is across the entire Western world. It's um, in this country, it was George Osborne's austerity, but we should remember that it also happened in the United States. And if you look at Europe, well, there's the fiscal compact and simultaneous fiscal tightening everywhere. So we had a massive, massive turn in 2010 towards essentially withdrawing money from the economy because we got, suddenly got terribly scared about government debt and deficits and offset that with continuing to put money into, essentially into financial markets with all sorts of spillover effects all over the place, not all of which were positive. So my argument is we didn't get that right. Um, and that, um, in a way, the sort of weird separation between the monetary authorities on, on the one hand and the fiscal authorities on the other hand kind of created that gap. What we need to do is bring them together and say, actually, when you have that kind of crisis, when you've got that amount of damage going on in your economy, you actually need your, your policies to be complementary. It makes no sense to be taking money out of the economy at the, at the lower level and feeding it back in at a much higher level. All you do is you widen inequality and you don't restore your economy. And I think that's what we've seen over the last 10 years. So what we need to be doing is giving poorer people money and then I think we'll find we won't need to prop up asset, asset markets quite so much. The, one of the other things I think striking about the rise in inequality as well is what it tells us about how our companies are run. So the now, Chris, the, ri the rise in inequality. Yeah, it, it's not Sorry. particularly correct that the inequality has risen. So, if you refer <laughs> to your, if you refer over the to last your, twenty years, uh, oh, yeah. Well, I mean, yep. uh, what I read, <laughs> the, the income of if the we're, top if we're in a lead, if we're in a leader conference, this is this is how I would talk. So yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> 
I'm not sure it has. No, so it was interesting. So I, I, was, I was literally looking up these figures this morning. And from 2006 to 2016, wealth inequality has remained substantially the same. It's the 1980s was the big, the big, the big substantial rise in inequality was the 1980s. But the very top 1%, although the numbers are very volatile, and frankly, the top 1% of income earners tend not to declare their income in any way that can be really judged because they have to take a lot of income in different ways. Um, it's very volatile because of um, different tax policies. So very rich people tend to move their income back and forward years to take advantage of tax policy. So even the top 1%, even though possibly there has been a slight rise, the actual levels of inequality broadly, even in wealth, which is really surprising, have stayed substantially the same over two decades. So inequality, sorry, sorry. How you weight wealth and income inequality depends on what interest rates are, surely. So is that wealth inequality taking interest rates into account or wealth inequality not taking into account? I don't know. <laughs> You're allowed to have to be able to look up things <laughs> in leader conference. <laughs> Francis. Yeah, well, Chris kind of handed me a little graph here, which is rather nice. But I can't show you because it's tiny. It's in your booklets. I, I, yes. OK, which shows it very much depends where your start point is. Yes, I, no, I just said over the last um, few so years. Yeah. You pick your start point at, say, 2006, and you run it to 2016, and you look across, you say, oh, look, it hasn't risen. But if you actually start in, say, 2003, and you run it to, 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 to 2016, it looks very different. So uh, your start points matter. Um, this was the, the um, pre-tax national income of the top 1%. But I wanted to make a point, actually. We keep talking about income inequality, and yet my whole thesis arguably, is, is actually about the dynamic between wealth and income. Mm -hmm. That it's not... Separating those out isn't straightforward. If you put money into asset markets and you prop up the stock market and you prop up bond markets and you have this ridiculous correlation between stocks and bonds that we've had now for 10 years, um, everything's rising. Property markets are rising because that was the effect of QE, really. Um, what you're doing is you are increasing wealth. And you may be increasing wealth across quite a lot of the income scale, because a lot of people have pensions, yeah? And a lot of people have property, yeah? But at the same time, um, th that, that can still go in hand in hand with people's incomes, incomes of working people stagnating or even falling. So you can end up with a disparity between rising wealth and stagnating income, and I think that's a lot of what we've seen in the last 10 years. Well, I think your point's very important. One of Tony Atkinson's students was Piketty, and he talks about the return to capital, yeah. um, unearned income, um, as it becoming progressively more important than income. Tony Atkinson, who I quote at the beginning, uh, was in no doubt that the top 1%, the share, and you're right about where the starting point, has risen dramatically in the US, somewhat less dramatically in the UK. But as he says, it doesn't have to be that way. It's not like that in the Netherlands, in France, in Germany. It doesn't actually have to be. The US and the UK look the worst. I mean, the, the before the financial crisis, in 1929, before the Great Crash, the top 1% in the US had 23% of total household income. And after the great crash, the financial crisis, the great crash of 1929, it went down to about 10%. And throughout the growth years of the 1950s and 1960s, when the US economy just chugged along, growing year after year, increasing prosperity and so on, the top 1% had about 10%. And exactly as Carlos said, when our income inequality started to take off in the late 70s and early 80s, the US took off, and in 2007, the top 1% had 23% total household income. We know what happened next. I say I'm an academic. I don't know whether correlation means causation. Um, Piketty thinks there's no doubt at all that that greed at the top uh, was responsible in part for the financial crisis. Uh, so this level that the top 1% has has changed dramatically, and it has grown, depending where you start. Uh, it certainly has grown in the UK, not quite as fast as in the US. Uh, and it has brought 
economic problems, quite apart from things I talk about, economic problems of the courts the sort of things that Francis just talked about. Can I ask you, I, I'm, I was very interested in this incomes issue and how much people, people sort of in their real lives, that's how they viewed economics. Will I have, will I have enough money at the end of the week to buy food, that type of idea, and I'm poorer at the end of the year than I was at the beginning of the year, even though I work. How much did monetary policy create the effect of falling incomes? Or were, were there other issues there around people not asking for wage increases because they were worried about their jobs. Um, I, just, I just wondered, Francis, what, what were some of the, I've always struggled to think of what the reasons are for the income stagnation and fall over the past decade, which I think has added to this whole debate about inequality. I think the income stagnation and fall is very much linked to the productivity puzzle, actually. Yes. Um, and it's fair to say... You're going to have to say what the productivity right, puzzle is. Right, the productivity <laughs> puzzle is basically that around about the time of the financial crisis, everybody's left arm fell off. And so they can't produce as much as, <laughs> much as they used to, roughly. Um, so um, the output per output, average output, output per worker per hour, roughly speaking, is um, somewhat lower than it's growing much less strongly than, than it was before the crisis. So we used to, we like historically put on about 2% an hour yeah. in terms of productivity. It's, it's and the then we just stopped been a lot less. <laughs> for some reason. Um, and his wages, wage growth, tends to be linked to productivity. There's a worker, if you produce more, you can, uh, you can be paid, you, and even if you're employed, you're employing more of your, you're earning more of your company, your company can pay you more. It tends to work like that. There's a little bit of a wedge, because companies like to make profits. Um, but generally, historically, um, productivity has, te um, wages have tended to rise with productivity. And so when your productivity is flat, so are your wages. So we don't know to what extent monetary policy contributes to that. There is an argument that very, very low interest rates have depressed investment, and productivity can be very driven by um, investment. Um, I look at companies sitting on cash hoards and think, you know, if they wanted to invest, they could. Um, and I want to know why they aren't. Um, you know, why are they not the productive opportunities, apparently? There's reams of literature on this. So I'm... I'm, I'm kind of sensitive to the argument that it's all the fault of the monetary policy. I think there's a fiscal policy issue, and I think there's also a corporate governance issue and a corporate behaviour issue, and you know, maybe even some so structural changes. Involved. Before Kamal started disputing me, <laughs> <laughs> um, the point I was trying yeah, sorry, to make was, um, <laughs> is it, it's a profound failure of shareholder capitalism, right? That, the, that we can allow chief executives to just be paid more and more and more and more of these higher and higher and higher ratios, not six, not 12, you know, 350 times. And it, I mean, I, I spend my time just wondering who, who are the, these remuneration committees, what goes through their heads? And they're like, well, he'll, he'll work for 55, but not 50 million a year. It's like, well, you know. It's obviously got to be worth it. I find it a, a really profound critique of modern shareholder capitalism, which I'm broadly in favour of, but, you know, it's not working. What, what I, what, I don't know if this is allowed, but I wanted to agree with a fellow That's allowed. panel member. Is that, <laughs> is that allowed? Is that allowed? That is allowed. Well, yeah. I would say the evidence supports exactly what <coughs> said, that if you look at health, which is why I look at all the time. If you're very poor, the absolute amount of money really matters. We have a calculation recently that if people in the bottom 10% of household income followed the healthy eating advice, they would spend 74% of household income on food. Now, I've heard so many Tory ladies with cut glass accents say, oh, I could teach them to cook, and they didn't. <laughs> the fact is, they would spend 74% of household income on food, which means they can't pay the rent, they can't heat the flat, they can't, uh, you know, it's uh, impossible. Absolute amount of money really, really matters. If you haven't got enough of it, you can't feed the kids, you can't pay the rent, you can't do anything. When you're above that threshold, then relative amounts matter, the kind of thing that you were talking about. And the health evidence supports your viewpoint. Then the relativities start to matter. You ask people, Breadline Britain, ask people, what does it mean to be poor? They say, I can't buy children new clothes. I can't entertain 
children's friends for a birthday party. So not being able to buy a pizza for some children's friends feels I'm in poverty. That's a relative measure. That's not an absolute pizza. It's not absolutely good for health. It's just, it's a relative measure. So I think it's exactly in line with what you were talking about. Low income, bad for health, because you can't buy healthy food, can't pay the rent, can't heat the flat and the like. At higher levels, the relativities really matter. You can't take your place in society without shame, to quote Adam Smith. So, Tom, you've been... Um, well, yeah, there's a couple of things that will just sort of um, marinate those like, points together. Yeah, firstly, I agree with what Kamal was saying earlier on about um, how um, potentially um, access to capital with regards to uh, uh, the benefits of AI and automation um, would definitely skew um, outcomes, particularly when I think AI will transform not just our economic lives, but our social and cultural lives. So it will be not just the fact that you know, people have you know, different access to um, sort of education or whatever it may well be, but the actual structure of their sort of social relations will be, will, um, will, will be different. And um, to your point, Francis, about, um, about, asset, about asset inequality, one asset that I care about quite a lot as a, as a, as a young person is with land, land and housing. And one of the big things I was looking into the other day was um, the value of land has just gone up absolutely massively in the past sort of, uh, 50 years or so. But the contribution of that to the exchequer, is basically, or of land value uh, it's in, by tax revenue, is basically been flat um, over that period of time. So that kind of begs the question as to like, what do we do about it? And I think there's a lot of political inertia. And for me, I, I had an argument with my dad about this. He, talk, he says that he's basically the kind of person that thinks that we, as young people, we buy avocados on toast and we, we, get, we, get, we get our coffees every single day, and that's why we can't afford to get a house in London. <laughs> rather, rather, rather than the fact that it's two, two thirds of our rent we have to go to getting a, you know, a crap one bedroom flat in, in zone four or whatever. Um, so I, I think it's really difficult when you have the kind of, uh, you know, the sort of. The, the children of Thatcher, if you like, in terms of this idea of taking personal responsibility, and, and that's the way out of it. It's very difficult to to move anything, and what I'd be interested in is how can we frame it in a way that people will actually care about and actually give action rather than just saying, oh, I care about it, and then in the polling booth, they don't want to um, have their homes raided by um, by Jeremy Corbyn's new, uh, new policy. <laughs> At one point, I think, there's, I think you're absolutely right. There, there's going to be, if you look into the future, which is I think is where inequality, be, I mean, it's concerning and frightening now, but becomes really concerning and really frightening in the future, there is going to be a massive um, uh, wealth transfer when the baby boomers transfer their property wealth mm. to their children. Mm. If, you are, if you are fortunate enough, well, they're already doing they're it, but there's, doing a, it. there's a huge wave to come as that generation born just post the war uh, die and hand on huge amounts of property wealth um, to the next generation. That will create um, an inequality bump because um, if you are not the child of a homeowner who bought their house um, before the huge property inflation of the 80s and 90s, you will simply be left and you will not get that wedge of money. And you can, you can see, if you look 10 years into the future, that lump of wealth, um, which is starting to crystallize, as you say, Francis, as, as baby boomers die, and comes to, frankly, my, to my generation, um, who are sort of the next generation down. That, that, that is a hu of huge concern, which is why the, um, the Labour Party report, which came after the IPPR report about everything above £125,000 of inheritance should be uh, taxed at pretty high rates rather than having an inheritance um, tax on inherited wealth. These things will become really important policy matters for us as a, as a country when we're thinking about inequality. Is there anything, we haven't heard an enormous amount from... Um, yes. Um, so, Charlotte. Charlotte. Thank you. Um, so, I, to the point about kind of benefits and you know what people can be left with. Um, I suppose thinking about Homo Deus um, and the mention of that and just having to have this digital literacy in order to access things. Um, it does seem like it's a risk of having such a compounding inequality because for instance the universal credit system um, has been rolled out by the government to be digital by default and um, so it is designed to be difficult to access unless you are digitally literate and um, so you sort of end up in this position where unless you already have things going for you it's 
it's very, very difficult to access them. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was just, I mean, sort of, um, you know, part of our capital, you know, that will really, really kick in. So your, your, your access to capital is such a huge return to your access. <coughs> are we, how on earth do we get to the point where consumption of wealth within a generation is, a, is, is normal? That unearned income, unearned wealth, transferred wealth, become socially sort of unacceptable? That's a question, sorry, Chris. Um, That's fine. That it was rhetorical. <laughs> um, anyone else? Madam? Yeah, I was just going to say the thing that bothers me most about inequality, actually, one of the many things, but one of the things that really bothers me is how people who have a lot of money make decisions on behalf of others who have no voice. Mm. And that gets worse and worse the greater the inequality what is. Do you, what, do you, what context do you mean? So, so everything from, you know, so I live in Nairobi and Kenya has one of the greatest sort of inequality rates. I'm not an economist, so you chat, so I'm not sure I can <laughs> describe it right. But, you know, there's huge inequality. And as a result, you have people who don't have access to education or access to health or access to very basic things. And then you have the people who are making the decisions or are being funded by the people who are at the top. Um, and they make decisions and create policies that pander to their concerns that are not necessarily the concern, for sure, not the concern. So, so we have a system, for instance, I'm involved a lot in um, peripheral web. Um, in education, and what I see there is just so ridiculously unfair. You have sort of 70% of the population going to very low-cost schools, so government schools, and the quality of education is such that something like 25% um, of the kids coming out of standard seven, which is sort of 12-year-olds, um, are reading at, stand at six-year-old levels. You know, it's just really terrible. Um, but there's no attention being paid to that. You think it's a, at least I think it's a crisis. Um, and the reason is because everybody who's making decisions, you know, about around education is not affected. Their kids are not going to schools like that. They're, you know, we have our members of parliament going to hospitals here in London, you know, so they're not bothered about how to you know, take care, they're not prioritizing building our hospitals, etc. So I think inequality is, it's evil actually, the level, at least to that extent. I just don't understand why anybody should earn 350% more than... 350 times more. Times more. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. It's even worse. It's even worse. Yeah. So I, I, I this, maybe, yes, ma'am. Uh, What's your name? Sorry. Rachel. Rachel. So what I'm hearing is that inequality is not really about paying perks at all, but about something more fundamental, how people live their lives and their potential prognosis. And that's why it's so significant and that's why it's so important. And I was really interested in the previous discussion about the use of language and how that was touched upon. And I'm wondering whether it might be time to question our use of the word prosperity in this context. because. If things are the way they are, are we really prosperous? If only a very small percentage of the population, or, or if, let's flip that around, if a significant percentage of the population are subject to structural and systemic inequalities from the outset, is it time to question ourselves and really think about how we're approaching things? Because that doesn't sound like a great society to live in. That doesn't sound like we're doing things right. That doesn't sound like a good life, a good world, a good community, aside from anything else. I don't know, I just, I, I think the focus on money at the expense of all else misses the point whilst also encapsulating it. There's a sense of it's, it's their prosperity, it's not Exactly, right. exactly. The, hang on, let me, let me just, sir, yeah. Oh. Um, you touched on remuneration committees. Um, uh, Heike Santo revealed a report which showed in the first five years of that um, policy coming into force uh, that no remuneration policies had been rejected at all. Uh, so between 2014 and 2018, none had been rejected. Um, I wondered what you thought, I know it's a question, apologies, but what sort of role corporate governance could play 
in terms of limiting executives' ability to um, channel profits into share buybacks to boost stock <coughs> options, to boost executive pay in this quite sort of cyclical way. something that would sustain an inequitable system. But actually the reason we have these enormous inequalities is sort of like Darwin and evolution. It's not really anyone's fault. It's just what happens when you have an uncontrolled free market and some things drift. And they drift in a parasitic and appalling way. They'll go on doing it unless there's something to stop them. We don't have anything to stop them. But that's not really greed because you need these differentials. If everyone else is paid whatever it is, 500 million pounds, and you're only paid 450 million pounds, the fact that it's an enormous amount of money still means you think you're worth less than the 500 million pounds are, you're a less good CEO, wow. Yeah? So, so that's one thing at the top end. And I think that framing this argument in terms of there are all these people who are freeloading, they are bad, is, is very natural, but it's possibly not the best way <coughs> to deal with it. I think perhaps the best way to deal with it was your observation about opportunity. So what is it that will increase opportunity for the people at the bottom who manifestly have less of it now, at least that's my perception, I don't know if it's actually true, but I guess it's true, than has been the case before. And I would have thought the right sort of government policy in terms of welfare, in terms of making, for example, better food cheaper rather than more expensive, in terms of making good schooling something that everyone can get, which means putting a lot more money into decent schools. We know that, but we know it works. All of these things are maybe the cheapest way of dealing with the bit of this problem that matters. I'm not saying that this 50 times thing is fair or right or morally correct. It's clearly completely wrong <laughs> and, and ridiculously wrong as well. But dealing with that is not actually itself going to give us what we need. And what we need is all that money put in at the bottom. And the, in the idea that we tax these 350 times down to something reasonable like 10 times, that in itself, I'm not sure that that gives us the money that we need. Maybe taxes on capital would give us money because there's that enormous amount of capital sitting there. Yeah. So, James. I don't know. I was, all, all I was going to say, well, I don't mean to, if anyone, anyone else wants to weigh in, I would, was it, was it, yeah, you go ahead, Bam. I'm just wondering whether this is um, not about a failure of capitalism as a thing. I mean, we need to rethink that first. As bad as things are here in the UK, if you contrast that with developing countries, you have it very good. It's wonderful here. And as, as the gaps between countries and worlds increases, what are we walking into in the future? What's going to happen to these nations with very young population who have been set up to fail um, just because they were born in certain parts of the world? What's going to happen in a hundred years? Which takes us nicely into reparations. So, <laughs> if, <laughs> so if we're talking about you know structural inequality that's caused here in the UK, that's caused by what has happened here in the UK. Well, think about what's happening in you know, a lot of countries around the world where Kenya, really, yes, for instance, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's 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 even like with with you know. Africa as a whole, its most productive citizens, its strongest citizens, were exported um, against their will, taken to other countries. So you start out with such a ridiculous disadvantage. You know, I'm saying now as Africa, so you know, America is a whole other, or, the, or, or, or where the people ended up is a whole other thing that I can't take on. But so what has happened in Africa, you start with that. If you came and removed the strongest, most capable, most able people from this society and then said, now, you know, come on, build, you know? And don't forget, and they gave them 50 years of colonization as well. Yeah, well, that's, yeah. Yeah, and they're now saying, fair play, let's compete. <laughs> they're never going to catch up. It's, right. 
<clears throat> so in the same way we're concerned about inequality here between the different people in the society here, it's also between countries and and what you know what do we feel about that? You know what um, oh we're not allowed to ask questions. You can ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. So Francis, I saw, I think I cut you off a little ago. That's fine. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to talk a little bit about sort of political economy, really. Um, there are, I think, very good political reasons for smoothing out wealth inequalities, and that is the tendency of richer people to, uh, to capture political power, to lobby, and to use their money to influence. And I don't just mean the top 1% in that. I mean, one of the things that hap is happening in Western democracies is that people who have assets um, may be in the majority and they have voting power and they will vote for policies that in their, their view will preserve that asset wealth and they'll do so at the expense of minorities. And I think that it's actually a, quite a challenge to democracy to work out how we preserve, how we maintain the, the incomes really of of minorities when there's a very determined large um, asset owning base who are voting for things that basically benefit them. Michael? Yeah, I'm pleased that we got a more global dimension. I mean, firstly, if you look at those Gini coefficients that you showed, and the US was whatever it was, 0.5, and the UK was 0.46. <coughs> Go to Kenya and see what the Gini coefficient, and you know, Brazil, it's 0.6, and then in Africa, I think South Africa's got the biggest for a variety of reasons that you can <coughs> understand. But it's, those inequalities are much bigger in low-income countries. And the glo Branko Milanovic has made a career of comparing in a breaking down inequalities, but the global inequalities between countries have got bigger in income and wealth. And so I think we've got to think in a global way. I chaired something called the World Health Organization Commission on Social Determinants of Health. And we were very struck in India. The Self-Employed Women's Association was upgrading the slums that their members lived in for $500 per household. Wow. You know, if you've got some aid agency, I don't know, it would be $100,000 per household or something, but for $500 per household. And we said in our report, one billion people in the world live in slums, informal settlements, and it would cost, thinking about the saver experience, a hundred billion dollars to upgrade the slums. And I thought, are we really going to say this in our report? We recommend you spend a hundred billion dollars to upgrade the slums. People think we're completely crackers. And that's what happens when you let academics loose. <laughs> Who's going to find a hundred billion dollars for anything? Last time I looked, we'd found eleven trillion dollars to bail out the banks. For one one hundred and tenth of the money we found to bail out the banks, every urban dweller in the world could have clean running water. So if we think about inequalities on a global scale, we maybe should be getting our priorities yeah. a bit different. As you said, we have it very good in Britain. Things look like hell. I mean, if the Lionesses win their semi-final, it'll look better. <laughs> um, but things look like hell at the moment, and they do look like hell at the moment, but they're really very good. And things have been getting better, not just in Britain, but globally. You know, Hans Rosling, uh, the late Hans Rosling, in a posthumously published book, pointed out that global poverty is going down, and health is improving, inequalities in health are, are getting smaller. I mean, things are really getting better. Um, globally, though we're not uniquely bad. It feels pretty god-awful at the moment. <laughs> you only have to open the newspaper and, uh, you know, go into cataclysmic depression, seeing a man from Honduras and his little girl drowned in the Rio Grande. You know, it's just appalling what's going on at the moment. But on a longer time frame, 
things have got dramatically better. That, as you can tell from what I talk about, that's no grounds for complacency because we, the, these benefits are shared most unequally. And to come back to your point, I agree with the latter part of your point, you know, about investing in early child development and education and the like. But greed is playing a role. I mean, if you, uh, Jacob Hacker's book, Winner Take All Politics, and he looks at the growth of income inequality in the US, where it has indisputably grown. And he goes through the various arguments. And in the end, the system is rigged, whether it's Trump's latest tax cut, and the policies, the pre-tax inequalities, the post-tax inequalities. I mean, just to give you one marker, child poverty. So it comes back to what I was saying about Kamel's um, point about absolute poverty and relative. So if you measure child poverty as a relative measure, less than 60% median income in different countries. In Norway and Finland and Denmark, it's 9%, 10% of child poverty. In the UK, 19.7%. And in the US, 29%. Why should 29% of kids in the US grow up in poverty? Relatively defined. Well, it's a political decision because those rich guys don't like paying tax and they don't want their money going to support the incomes of poor families. And I think there is greed and selfishness going on. I don't think it's just sort of Darwinian evolution. <laughs> so Agatha, our tortoise, has run her race. Um, uh, normally at this point I would um, attempt to summarize. <laughs> but actually, I think one of the things that's really striking is I think there are some things for us. I was actually, one of the things I was thinking about before this is it's actually quite a hard topic to report about. It's sort of easy to do, not easy, it's, it's a thing that journalists do to talk about poverty because we can sort of contextualise that. We can go to a place where you can see poverty. It's actually really hard to report on facets of inequality. Like how, how do we make that visceral and, and comprehensible? But actually, I think there are a few things I've got that I think we should, we should think about. I think, the, I think we should talk about Kenya. I think we should talk about reparations. I think the, the what obligations Britain in particular has about the rest of the world, not least given that we're going to try to redefine our relationship with it over the next few years, is not a bad thing to start asking, right? I think the, I thought the Tom's point on land prices is worth pursuing. We have a sort of destroyed land market. It is one of the weird things about the Liberal Democrats that one of the only th policies they've settled on for a century is land taxes. <laughs> so, but um, that's maybe something that sort of we should uh, we should talk about. Um, I think the to your points are on remuneration. I think the the as I said, the title of this originally came from our sort of our interest in actually the, the extent to which the way people are paid disguises inequality within companies, and the way that remuneration committees um, do this stuff. I actually think there's something weirdly more abhorrent about giving someone 99 million pounds for a job and then a use of a plane that costs a million quid than giving them 100 million quid. And it's an irrational thing, but, I, I can't, but it's, that's how I feel about it. Um, and I'm sort of interested in, the, in, the, uh, in how all that works that is proving hard to get into because they are hiding it for a reason. But I think that's something we should keep, uh, keep running at. Um, can I th ask you to thank our panelists, Francis Coppola, <laughs> Kamal Ahmed, and Salak Obama. <laughs> there are refreshments <laughs> next door.